design and manufacture other other stuff. This is video two, looking at the other parts of the design and manufacture course, which is not related to materials and manufacture. This video will cover health and safety, primary and secondary functions of products, the rise of consumerism, branding, the design team, miniaturization, production planning, and quality control and insurance. As you become more familiar with the content, try pausing the video and seeing if you can think of the key points from each area before I discuss them. The first area we'll look at is health and safety. There are a few key things to remember when discussing health and safety. Firstly, all workers need to wear appropriate protective equipment such as goggles, hard hats, masks for fumes and high-vis vests, etc. They also need to be properly trained in machinery and safe use of hazardous materials. It's the manufacturer's responsibility to ensure that the products which leave the warehouse are safe for the consumer to use, e.g. sharp edges have been removed and that any joining method is secure. It's the designer's responsibility to ensure that their designs meet the necessary British standards for that type of product. For a child's toy, this may involve ensuring there are no finger traps or that the product is stable enough. Clear instructions would also need to be supplied for the construction or use of the product. The consumer will expect that the product is not going to harm them whilst in use. If a brand gets a bad rep for poor safety slash quality assurance, then this will affect sales as users move to a more reliable brand. Primary and secondary functions. A product is usually designed to fulfill a specific job or function. The main job it does is called its primary function. This was the task it was made to do. The secondary function is the jobs that the product can also do. The primary function of a mobile phone until recently was to make phone calls. It could also send texts and play simple games like Snake. Therefore, these would be considered secondary functions. Nowadays, a mobile phone's primary function is a little harder to define. Most people would now class their phone's main function as a means to search the internet or keep up to date with social media. Making calls would be considered something your phone also does. A bus stop's primary function is to tell the buses where to stop on the road. Secondary functions of the bus stop could include providing shelters for users, a seat to restaurant, or advertising space. Rise of consumerism, want rather than need. Consumerism was said to largely explode in the 1980s, where consumers began to spend on objects which they wanted rather than truly needed. The result of this is that people started to almost compete with each other in terms of what material items they owned. The term, keeping up with the Joneses, refers to this phenomenon, where neighbours would look enviously over the garden hedge at the next door neighbour's lawnmower and think to themselves, I'm going to go and trump his lawnmower with a fancier model. This drives sales and ensures that technology is encouraged to develop quickly to keep up with this consumer want. Peer pressure also drives sales and makes people feel inadequate if they don't have the latest phone or games console, for example. It's this pressure and the desire to be on top that ensures whenever a new iPhone comes out, people queue for up for hours to say they were among the first to own this new phone. They will then make sure that everyone knows this when back in school or the workplace. YouTube, oatmeal, what it's like to own an Apple product for a really good sum up of consumerism and peer pressure. We now live in a throwaway culture. That is to say, is instead of making do and mending, users are far more likely nowadays to just throw out a piece of tech rather than try to fix it. This leads to products being dumped in landfill. A washing machine may have lasted 30 to 40 years in the mid 20th century due to parts being replaced. Nowadays, you'd probably expect the washing machine to be thrown out after 5 to 10 years. Branding. Think of a brand which you like. What makes it desirable in your eyes? Brands are hugely important in the sale of products. Products which have been made by a good brand in the eyes of the consumer will be more likely to sell than brands which the consumer feels aren't as good. Brands tend to have logos that are instantly recognisable and that's a big selling factor. If a consumer is happy with a Samsung phone, they're more likely 
to then buy a Samsung laptop. This drives sales. The problem with brands, however, is that if people sense that a brand is not reliable, for example with the Red Ring of Death for Xbox 360, users can lose faith in a brand and this will affect future sales. Consumers are also more aware of workers' rights and conditions and this can also affect the brand. When it was exposed that Nike, among others, used sweatshops, this affected the Nike brand negatively. Lastly, if a celebrity is linked to a brand, this can have both a positive and negative effect. If the celebrity is popular, this can drive sales. However, if the celebrity is caught up in a scandal, this can lead to users disowning the brand. Design Team Think of a successful team that you've been part of, or that you support. What makes a successful team? Design is a very tough marketplace with strong competitions to your products from many angles. The only way to survive in this sort of environment is with a successful design team. Each member must be exceptionally skilled in their specific job and each member relies on each other to do their best at all times. The designer is the creative heart. They're relied upon to design products which are very desirable to users getting in their heads to find out what they truly need or want and delivering exactly this. The engineer ensures that the designer's creative spark is able to be made into a reality. They will be able to test the product or materials using both computer simulations as well as lab tests to ensure that the product is usable. There will always be communication between these two jobs as changes to design will often have to be made in order to satisfy the engineer. Sometimes there may even be conflict as the designer may be reluctant to make changes which they see as impacting on the design. Instead, they may see up to the engineer to make it work. A materials technologist will develop materials which will offer the product competitive games. A tennis racket, for example, could be made lighter whilst maintaining strength or the frame may be more responsive through the grip in order to give the player more feel. The accountant will ensure that the research and development of the product is properly worked out to ensure everyone knows how much money is available for each stage. They will also be involved in working out the recommended retail prices for the product as well as money available for advertising, etc. The ergonomist is responsible for sharing their understanding of how a user is likely to interact with the product. They will be relied upon to share anthropometric data as well as confirming how much force a user would be able to exert, e.g. would the child be able to lift the lid off the toy box, how much strength would be required. An in-house design team is one that all work from the same design firm 52 weeks a year. They are employed full time by the firm. The design team will be made up of all members discussed and they will all have the very best interests of the team at heart. Their jobs may well depend on the success of their next product, so it's key that they all work together to ensure that it's a success. In-house design teams are very expensive, as they are employed full-time. If they're not working on a task, they'll still be getting paid. In-house design teams may also have to sign a contract stating that even when they leave the employment of the company, they may not work for a competitor for several years. This is due to all the sense of information and design decisions which they will have been involved with whilst working for the previous employer. Outsourced design works a little differently. Usually used by smaller design firms, outsourcing involves using shorter time contracts with specialists to develop areas of the design which you perhaps don't have a specialist in, for example with materials technology. They don't require to be paid 52 weeks a year and can be used as and when needed. However, they may not be driven to succeed as a traditional in-house design team as they may not be as invested in the product succeeding. They will perhaps be simply happy getting paid and moving on to the next project. Miniaturization. When man landed on the moon, the computing power used was far less than the computing power in your phone. Miniaturization refers to technology becoming more powerful and at the same time getting smaller. Summed up as, 
more performance in smaller packages. When mobile phones were introduced, they showed a professional looking man in a suit on his phone whilst carrying a briefcase. This briefcase wasn't for their work however, it was for the battery for his phone. Through research and development, driven by consumers demanding more from their products, the batteries became smaller and far more powerful. This is the case for every component in design. As developments occur, technology becomes more powerful, while usually becoming smaller in size. Production planning. Every step of the design manufacture process revolves around trying to make the whole process as efficient as possible. Any inefficient planning will have a direct effect on sales. This may involve a delay in a product being available and missing a launch date, to stock levels not being able to cope with the demands of the consumer. If a product is constantly out of stock, or there is a delay in the launch, this will annoy consumers and perhaps make them look elsewhere. There are several ways in which the design team can plan the design and manufacture of products efficiently. One of these is to use a Gantt chart to help with planning. Gantt charts involve listing all the tasks that need to be completed on the left hand side and the time available to complete all these jobs across the top. The tasks are then blocked in according to how they require to be completed. This gives the whole team a very quick and easy way of checking to see if they are on target to meet deadlines. It also shows them whether or not there are any pressure points which may cause delays. There are two main types of manufacturing planning systems which you need to be familiar with. One is called just-in-time manufacture. This involves running of machines until they generate just enough components and then switching them off, rather than running them constantly. This means that they don't need to store spare parts in expensive climate-controlled warehouses. The problem with just-in-time manufacture is that if the machine breaks down, they don't have a big stock to then use as a replacement. This can mean that the whole production line may have to shut down due to this lack of stock. Another aspect of production planning is the use of standard components. This involves manufacturers buying in components and parts from other manufacturers rather than making these parts themselves. This can be less expensive than needing to buy specialist machinery and training operators. The downside is that you are now relying on a third party to ensure that parts are delivered on time and that these are up to your quality standards. Batch manufacturer um, refers to the process of making many parts at once and then assembling these at a later date. For example, in a dining chair making factory, all the legs may be made in one area, all the seat pads may be made in another, and all the backs in another still. These would then be pulled together to form the product. This is more efficient than a worker making each chair from scratch start to finish. This is usually the case as the machine is set up to make specific parts and it takes time to reset these machines. Production line manufacture involves a product working its way along a conveyor belt and components are added as they move along. The most typical example of this is the car production line, where both cam manufacturer, e.g. robots, and human skilled workers work together to assemble these products. Quality control and assurance. Questions in the final exam about quality control or quality assurance will focus on the steps the manufacturer has to take in order to put out safe products and what the consumer would expect from these products. From the manufacturer's point of view, this can be split into three main parts. Ensuring that the raw materials coming into the factory are of a good quality, a poor quality of raw material will result in a poor quality of product. The raw materials or parts may be coming from a different supplier, so there is a chance that the supplier does not share the same quality standards. The quality of manufacture is also vitally important. If the product has been manufactured with errors, then this will mean that the product may be liable to break or not perform its function well. Post-manufacture checks will also be carried out to ensure that the assembly of the product meets the standards set. It will also ensure that there are no rough edges or sharp bits that could harm the user. Similar to the points raised in the health and safety section, the consumer will expect to be able to use the product safely without coming to harm. 
they will also expect all functions of the product to operate without fail.